Hello, Lakeview family, and welcome to this final video in our series on Waiting Well. Um, we hope to have some more information coming out for you guys in the next few weeks on where School of the Word is going to go after this. Um, but for now, we are going to finish this series with the passage the Lord used to help me, uh, kind of inspire me to do this series in the first place. Um, and that is from 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, the, the part that I really stands out when I think of this series is this. It says, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? And I read that, and I think God just kind of jumped out in my mind and, and said that this is what I want you to think about. What does it look like to wait for the day of the Lord? How should we be waiting now in a, in a season where we're aware of waiting? What does it look like to wait well? And, and we've been walking through that for the past few weeks. We've seen in uh, Mark 13 that waiting well looks like seeing all of our trials and tribulations as leading down the definite path God has set to the return of his son. We've seen in Romans 8 that while waiting often involves a lot of groaning, um, all of our present suffering is not disconnected from our hope. It's actually the means by which God produces glory in his people. And we've seen with Isaiah that um, while we are waiting, we need to be beholding not only the promises God has given us, but the one who makes those promises, bringing awareness of his strength into our seasons of wilderness. And today I want to look at Peter's answer to conclude this series. And here's how he answers it uh, in brief. He, he says in verse 14, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. We are to wait as people at peace. We're going to come back to 2 Peter at the end of today, but in the meantime, I want to consider Titus, where Paul really gives the, the same answer, um, but in typical Paul fashion, he, he spends a lot more time to say it. He kind of fleshes it out some more, and I think we can learn a lot by seeing how both Paul and Peter explain what it means to live without spot or blemish and to live at peace, what Paul is going to say is to live self-controlled. A little context, as we, before we get into Titus 2, um, Paul is writing Titus to Titus, uh, who he has left in Crete to sort of shepherd and care for the fledgling churches in that region. And uh, a major theme you'll notice in Titus is the connection of faith and action, of belief and the way we are living. So he writes instructions on choosing elders, and he teaches Titus to focus on not only the doctrinal agreement of those elders, but the lifestyle that they have, the outcome of their life and their family and the way they're known in the community. He's going to write to correct some false teachers that are in the, they're dealing with in, in Crete, and what he focuses on is not so much the errors they're preaching doctrinally, but the the obviously false lifestyles they're living, the greed they have, the laziness and predatory nature of, of the way they're preying on the ones they're supposed to be serving. And in chapter two, Paul's gonna start painting a picture of, of a positive picture of what it means to live out of the faith that we have in Christ. Starting in verse 11, he's gonna root it in what God has done, and then he's immediately gonna move to how we should live in light of what God has done in bringing salvation. So we read Titus 2, starting in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Paul goes back to basics here and he says, in light of what God has done, appearing in Christ and bringing salvation, 
here's the posture with which you should be living. One, you should be living self-controlled, upright, godly lives. And two, you should be waiting for, anticipating, looking and putting your hope in the return of Christ. I th thinking about that posture, it kind of comes to mind the, the way kids react on a, the, if you're traveling on vacation, going to Disney World or the beach, right? The, the normal way you would expect your kids to behave there is to kind of be in the back seat, just uncomfortable, kind of complaining, arguing about whose turn it is for the iPad and who poked who and when are we gonna eat and kind of just, just not much self-control going on in the back seat. But, but Paul is saying, don't be like that. As you're waiting for your hope, be self-controlled. Sit in the back seat and be calm. Be steadfast, be peaceful. Be the same way as Peter would say it, at peace, not freaking out or so caught up in the discomfort of your present moment, but looking ahead to the hope that you have. And because of you're so excited about where you're going, you're so excited about Disney World, you can wait. You can be self-controlled here. We're supposed to be looking ahead, so caught up in the fact that Christ is returning, that we can endure patiently whatever sufferings may be occurring to us as we wait. And then Paul's gonna push this into some categories where it's, it's particularly hard to be self-controlled. Right, here's what he says, starting in verse, chapter three, verse one. He says, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one to avoid quarreling, to be gentle and to show perfect courtesy to all people. We often, when we, when we look ahead to Christ's return, we often use that grand image to inspire us to grand deeds, to big actions, and, and that's appropriate because the Bible does that too, right? In, in Acts 1, as Christ is ascending, he tells his disciples, you're gonna be my witnesses in all Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And then the angel looks down and says, after Christ has gone, says, why are you still standing there? The one who you just saw go, he's gonna come back. Basically, go and get busy with what he's told you to do. Right, we, we should be aware that Christ is returning and using our time well, waiting well for him by using the talents and opportunities he's given us to accomplish big things. And also, in Titus here, Paul is looking ahead to say, while you're waiting, while you're doing those big things, be people who are at peace. Be self-controlled. And, and those feel like very different sort of energies in what we're supposed to do, but they're actually not contradictory. If, you, if you've ever seen an interview with Drew Brees after he wins a football game, you see both of these things existing at the same time in one person, right? On the one hand, you see someone who is passionate about what he's done. You can tell he works hard, he cares deeply, he's putting all of his effort into this game that he loves. And at the same time, you see a man who is self-controlled who is at peace, who you, you never see him um, getting big or with a chip on his shoulder calling people out. You don't see him bashing the refs. You don't hear him complaining about teammates. He's both passionate and self-controlled at the same time. And this is what Paul wants us to be like as we are waiting for Christ's return, to be focused on what matters so much that we can ignore all the rest. Is this how people experience us? Do they experience us as people who are self-controlled as they encounter us? Are we, uh, as we discuss things that we care about deeply, theology, politics, parenting practices, do people experience as us as people that Paul would describe as gentle or as, as quarrelsome? When, when we speak about rulers and authorities, read governors and mayors. Do people hear in our tone that we relate to them with submission or, or criticism as if, if they deserve, we, they owe us something? When we, are we people that, people wouldn't even imagine gossiping around you because you, they just can't imagine you joining in. You never speak evil of anyone 
and they, they just can't imagine that you would even want to hear what they have to say. Are we people who are self-controlled, godly, at peace, as Paul is describing here? As I think about this, a, a picture that came to mind is, is a story from, uh, a, a story song by the Grey Havens and their song, Three Birds in Babylon. And the story song sort of pictures this woman who's been released from the heart of stone, this, the prison that is Babylon. But every day she comes back to the friends and relatives that she has left behind. And here's what she says. She says, look up, look at the dawn. Yes, I escaped the shadows once I listened to the sun. And of course, no one listens to her. They just scoff and mock her. Um, they they talk about all the things that she's given up, but every day she comes back and says the same thing. Look up, look at the dawn, you can be free too. She doesn't respond to what they're saying about her. She doesn't focus on her present circumstances. She is looking ahead to her hope, proclaiming what matters most to her. And in the third verse, her hope is rewarded as Christ does return, and everyone sees it in the end. Everyone sees they have been the fools. They have not lived well. They have given up what they thought was, they have given up what was truly great for what they thought was better. You may not be in the same circumstance. You may not be living in a place where people are scoffing and mocking your hope in Christ. You may just be living through the difficulty of staying at home or of the troubles and trials in this world. But, but when people hear you speak, when they see you live, do they see someone who is focused on your hope, who so much is caught up in the idea of what is coming, of the hope of Christ's return, that you can ignore all that is around you? Are you looking up to what is coming, or are you mostly just caught up in whatever's happening around you right now? We come back to Peter's answer, and he's, he's giving us the same picture here in, in a wonderfully succinct way. He's writing to people, too, who are experiencing real suffering. If you read the letters of Peter, a lot of them are caught up with encouragement for people who are just having a hard time in life, who, who are being scoffed and mocked and abused because of their faith in Christ. And, and this is what Peter says to them. He says, look up to what is coming. Second Peter verse three, chapter 3, starting in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt away as they burn? But according to this promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Peter goes back to the words of Christ for telling his return. You should hear Mark 13 in the beginning of this passage. And he says, because all of these things are passing away, whatever circumstances you're facing right now, whatever wilderness you are wading through, it's not gonna last. It's all gonna be burned up. But you aren't. You're gonna still be here. You're gonna outlast all of these circumstances. You're gonna outlast the stars in the heavens. And so focus on what matters. Christ has redeemed you, and when he comes back to get you, how will he find you? This is what we should focus on. Are we going to be godly, upright, self-controlled? Is Christ going to find us to be people at peace, looking up, waiting for his return, hoping for it with, in ways that affect the way we live? Or is he going to find us just like irritable kids in the back seat, arguing about iPads and snacks? Are we more aware of the hope to which we are going or the difficulty of this present circumstance? 
And I, I recognize that's, that's not an easy thing to say. It's, it's a simple thing to say. Right? The logic here is not complicated, but, but to do this, to live this way is hard because to do this, you have to believe something really big. It's a big thing to get your heart around the idea that the hope we have coming is sufficient to ignore whatever suffering we're dealing with today. And if that feels too big for you, if peace seems too difficult for the moment that you're living in, it is, and that's okay. Because our peace doesn't come from us. Right, Titus 2, if you noticed, said that it is God who trains us to live godly, upright, self-controlled lives. This doesn't come from us, this comes from God. Where do we get peace and joy? You remember, these, these are fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Paul and Peter are encouraging us to have self-control, but at the same time, they recognize that doesn't come from us. That comes from the Spirit. All we do is look to God, and He transforms us. 2 Corinthians 3.18 has a beautiful picture of this. It says, And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Whatever trials we're facing, whatever wilderness we're wading through, we, we don't get peace just by laying on our beds at night and rehearsing all the reasons that we don't need to be freaking out. If you've ever done that, you find you don't get a lot of peace from that anyway. We don't have self-control by clenching our fists and biting our tongues. We get peace and joy and self-control by looking up, by looking to God and letting the Spirit lead us. This comes from Christ. So how then should we live as we are waiting for the return of Christ? We are to aim at lives that are peaceful, that endure patiently, that are self-controlled because we know Mark 13, that all our tribulation is leading to, it's just the birth pains of the return of Christ. Because we know, Romans 8, that all of our suffering is the means by which God produces glory in us. And because we learn from Isaiah that as we look up to the one who promises us great things, the awareness of his strength will produce peace and joy in us as we walk through our wilderness. Thank you again for your attention during this series. I, I hope that this has encouraged you to wait, not as though everything around you is waiting on random chance to turn or someone to figure out our situation, but we are waiting in the definite plan of our sovereign God. And we can look to him and have true hope for this present moment. We'll be back again in a few weeks, we hope, with some more content. We'll get some more information about that. Uh, those who are on the email chain will send out an email. Otherwise, you can just come back to whatever source you uh, are watching or listening to this on right now, and we will hopefully be posting something else in the next few weeks. All right, thanks.